Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. For our in-house guests, we would ask that last courtesy check that our mobile devices have been silenced or turned off as we prepare to begin. And of course, those watching online are welcome to send their questions or comments at any time, simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And of course, we will post today's program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference as well. Leading our discussion is Becky Norton Dunlop, who serves Heritage as the Ronald Reagan Distinguished Fellow. As a conservative movement leader, she is an active board member for numerous public policy organizations and associations. She advocates on behalf of Heritage's American Conservation Ethic, which we have copies of if you would like one, and advances energy and natural resources policy in general. She previously served us here at Heritage as Vice President for External Relations. Prior to joining Heritage, Mrs. Dunlop served as Secretary of Natural Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia in the cabinet of then Governor George Allen. She also had significant roles in the Reagan administration in both the Office of Presidential Personnel and Cabinet Affairs at the White House. Of particular importance, however, in the context of today's program, she concluded her Reagan administration tenure at the Department of the Interior, where she served as the Deputy Undersecretary of the Department and later as Assistant Secretary for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. Please join me in welcoming Becky Norton Dunlop. Becky? Thank you, John, and let me add my welcome on behalf of the Heritage Foundation to each of you who are here today. I think we have a very uh, interesting discussion, and um, it's certainly one that is going to provide you with a lot of good information uh, about a topic that needs some good information shared about it. Um, <clears throat> as you know from the announcement about this program, the Endangered Species Act, will reach the half-century milestone in several years. And one of the questions that uh, really needs to be asked is, has it worked? Has it worked? Do government programs work? It's a good question to be asked. We have some uh, Excellent presenters today, and then we're going to have a good Q&A period. I'm going to introduce the three presenters in the order in which they will be presenting, and then we will have a, a, a time when we can ask questions. The first speaker today is Rob Gordon, my colleague here uh, at the Heritage Foundation. He is a visiting senior research fellow here, where his recent research has addressed the Endangered Species Act, EPA's Gold King Mine Disaster, and Reorganization at the Department of Interior. Just before returning to Heritage as a research fellow, Mr. Gordon let, led the Trump administration's regulatory reform transition team. This is a fact that was disclosed to the public in Politico. We are not releasing this information today. He developed, in that work, he developed the executive order requiring the designation of regulatory reform officers in each federal department, a policy that has been pursued by President Trump. Previously, Mr. Gordon was staff director of the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations and senior advisor on endangered species for the House Natural Resources Committee for the 114th Congress. He served as senior advisor for strategic outreach here at the Heritage Foundation, and prior to that as professional staff of the Committee on Resources in the 108th and 109th Congresses, where he crafted major provisions of an Endangered Species Act rewrite, which passed the House of Representatives with substantial bipartisan, bipartisan support. Mr. Gordon was a founder of the National Wilderness Institute, where he then served as executive director. This was a, a wonderful organization which brought truth, transparency, integrity, and information to the public about natural resources. The institute managed research, litigation, and uh, testified before Congress on a wide variety of issues. 
Mr. Gordon served for two terms as a board member of the Commonwealth of Virginia's Board of Conservation and Recreation. He graduated with a BA from Vanderbilt University. Following his presentation, we'll hear from Dr. Rob Roy Ramey. Dr. Rob Roy Ramey II earned his bachelor's degree in biology and natural history from the University of California, Santa Cruz. His master's degree in wildlife ecology from Yale University and his PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology from Cornell University. His postdoctoral experience included research at the University of Colorado Boulder and the Center for Reproduction of Endangered Species at the San Diego Zoo. He has served as curator of vertebrate zoology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, after which he served as a consulting science advisor to the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks at the Department of Interior. In 2007, he founded Wildlife Science International, Inc., and began consulting full-time on scientific issues involving the Endangered Species Act. In 2009, he also began serving as science advisor for the Center for Environmental Science, Accuracy, and Reliability. Dr. Ramey has an active research program and recent research projects, including scientific issues surrounding the greater sage grouse, the delta smelt, desert bighorn sheep, Mexican wolves, and African elephants. Our wrap-up speaker for today will be Jonathan Wood. Jonathan is an attorney at Pacific Legal Foundation where he practices environmental and constitutional law with a focus on the Endangered Species Act. He is a graduate of the NYU School of Law, the London School of Economics, and the University of Texas. Jonathan also works on environmental law and policy issues as an adjunct fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center and a member of the Federalist Society's Environmental Law and Property Rights Practice Group's Executive Board. So without further ado, we will bring Rob Gordon to the podium, followed by Dr. Rob Roy Ramey and Jonathan Wood. Rob? Well, good afternoon. Uh, glad that all of you could uh, join us. And I'm, I'm glad I get to go first uh, because I read regulatory comments, um, which is kind of boring compared to being crocod Crocodile Dundee or a high-powered attorney. Um, so I'm, I'm glad they follow me. Uh, on, on endangered species, when we talk about it, so often we're, we, we talk about, uh, we focus on economic impact. And um, one thing we know about the economic impact is, is that it's, it's significant, it's large, um, but we don't really know the total extent of it. Uh, there's a report that comes out every year uh, from the Department of Interior, and I think the most recent one had about $1.5 billion in outlays by federal agencies. We know that's a f kind of a fraction uh, of what the cost is. Um, we get some glimpse glimpse of costs from economic impact analyses that are done in association with critical habitat uh, listings for individual species. Uh, for habitat, that can be uh, tens or hundreds of thousands of acres or millions of acres and costs that can reach in the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's even with all sorts of uh, devices and tactics used to make those costs seem smaller. So uh, the impact is is so significant, we know, that, that now people are willing to engage in processes to try and head off listings, pre-listing activities that um, entail all sorts of pretty uh, rigorous uh, regulation, uh, in a sense, and, and economic impact. Uh, but they're doing that to prevent something from being added to the endangered species list because it might even be worse. Uh, all these impacts are you know, in theory, endured so that we can save endangered species. And uh, we could spend uh, a day or two talking about each one of those words, save and endangered and species, because they're a little more complicated than um, what, what one might think on the surface. Uh, 
but the impetus for a report that Heritage just released that I've been working on was uh, kind of started with looking at that word save. Uh, but before I, I get into that, what I'd like to do is just kind of give a little sketch of the ESA and how it works. Uh, the definition uh, in the law of conservation uh, is that conserve means to use and the use of all methods and procedures which are necessary to bring an endangered species or threatened species to the point at which the measures provided pursuant to this act are no longer necessary. That's, that's what it means to conserve. So basically, with the ESA, we identify a plant or animal that's threatened or endangered, possibly threatened or endangered with extinction. We put it on a list, uh, and at that time, maybe designate critical habitat for it. And then it is regulated, and uh, hopefully recovery activities are undertaken. And we get to the point where the species can be delisted. And that kind of completes the cycle. And of course, throughout that process, there's all kinds of litigation sprinkled in, which I, I think Jonathan will uh, address to some degree. But it, essentially, everything's driven by listing. You know, once an animal or plant is on the list in the Federal Register, it's subject to the provisions of the ESA. And that listing process uh, is, uh, includes an analysis of what we call five factors, uh, the threatened or actual uh, loss of habitat, overutilization of the species, disease or predation, uh, the inadequacy of regulatory mechanisms or other natural or man-made factors. And after analyzing those, the agency determines whether or not that plant or animal is supposed to go on the list, and they're supposed to do so using the best available scientific and commercial data. Um, I often use the acronym uh, best available data, BAD. Um, and the, the problem with the word best is it's comparative. It doesn't mean that the data are reliable, verifiable, or sufficient to reach a scientific conclusion. All of this process, the listing process, is governed by uh, a law known as the Administrative Procedures Act, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which requires notice and comment. and has, a, in my opinion, a fairly low bar for the agency to meet. It can't engage in uh, activities that are arbitrary and capricious. And if you decide to challenge the agency on its regulations, um, you face a pretty stiff hurdle with something called Chevron deference, uh, which is basically the courts defer to the agency in the interpretation of their own regulations. And that would seem like, you know, maybe there's some safeguards there that prevent mistakes, uh, but uh, I don't think in practice that's really the case. We, we still get a lot of regs that particularly with regard to the designation of endangered and threatened species that are highly inaccurate. The delisting process, as opposed to the listing process, is basically the same thing but done in reverse. They look at the same five factors, and then at the end of that process, they, they have a, a possibility of taking the, an animal or plant off the list based on one of three conditions. Uh, if the species is found to be recovered, it can be delisted. If it's found to be extinct, it can be delisted. And if it's found that the original da data used to list the species are in error, it can be listed, delisted. So after uh, almost a half century, where, we are, where are we? Uh, at last count, there's 1,662 uh, domestic species on the list, and 84 have been delisted. About half that number were removed because they are either extinct or were recognized to be data errors. And 41 of them uh, are officially recovered. That number's gone up just a tad since my paper went to bed because of four recent delistings. Uh, but the, the findings are essentially the same. Now, I'm not going to say with regard to the, the species that have been delisted on the basis of recovery, that there's been no recoveries. There have been. You know, we would all agree that the, the wolf has increased in number and the grizzly bear. Uh, there are subspecies of, of white-tailed deer and Canada goose uh, that have increased in number. There are other species that have increased in number, like the um, uh, bald eagle, the, the brown pelican, the peregrine falcon, uh, and have been delisted. But in many of those cases, the primary factor um, or the most important factor often was not the Endangered Species Act itself, but unrelated 
events like the ban or, or the regulation of uh, DDT. Um, unfortunately, although of those 40-some species that have been delisted and called recovered, there's a, there's a large portion of them, about half, a little bit more. Um, while they're officially called recover, that's not, that's not accurate. Uh, the reality is that they should have been removed from the endangered species list on the basis of data error. And they're covered in detail in my report, and I'll just you know, kind of mention three quickly. Um, one, for example, is Hoover's Woolly Star, a plant found out west, and uh, after it was added to the endangered species list, uh, agencies were required to make sure that any actions that they undertook didn't uh, jeopardize the species or adversely modify critical habitat. Uh, and as a consequence, more people were out looking for it. And after it was listed, it was discovered, hey, there's really actually four metapopulations of this thing. And they started counting, and they looked at one of these metapopulations, and they decided, you know what? There's about 135 million plants in one of these populations. And the Fish and Wildlife Service decided, well, we, we should take it off. Uh, and they did. Uh, but they didn't do what I think would be the natural conclusion, uh, which is to say that there are enough of these things that it should have never been put on the endangered species list and instead took it off and proclaimed it in the regulation as having been recovered. Uh, another example would be the Tinian monarch, a bird found on a Pacific uh, island. And uh, it too, was, like the Hoover's woolly star, was undercounted. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service looked at a report uh, of an observation of 50 birds on that island, and they interpreted that to be an estimate for the total number of birds on the island. It wasn't, it was one person's observation of maybe what they saw in one day. And in fact, the bird was quite plentiful. And um, it, it was at the point where it was the second most common bird on the island uh, when the Fish and Wildlife Service delisted it and proclaimed it yet again another success uh, for recovery under the ESA. Subsequently, it's interesting to note that, it, that it's been petitioned for relisting um, by the Center for Biodiversity. And one of the arguments the center has made is that uh, stochastic events, which is kind of a fancy word for random, uh, could harm the bird. And specifically, they mentioned typhoons. Well, that island's been out there for a long time, and it's been hit by a lot of typhoons. In fact, it was hit once during World War II. Uh, and, uh, that was during a battle in which there had been weeks of shelling by the United States Navy, uh, the aerial debut of napalm on the island, and then an amphibious assault and brutal uh, ground combat and uh, artillery barrage uh, between U.S. and Japanese forces. And somehow the bird bounced back from that. Um, yet we're considering, you know, we, the Center for Biodiversity has sent in a petition and the response from the Fish and Wildlife Service was, well, it might be warranted to put it back on the list. Another example is something called Agert's sunflower. And basically, Agert's sunflower was added to the endangered species list uh, because there was concern that there weren't a, lar a large number of them, and a lot of them were growing along highways. And um, the rule listing Agert's sunflower uh, indicated that one of the threats it faced was highway maintenance. Essentially, people cutting down brush along the highway might come and, and cut this fairly rare plant. It was subsequently determined that agar sunflowers, a plant that kind of thrives on disturbance, and um, it was growing along the highways because they were mowing along the highways. That's why it was there. Uh, rather than saying, hey, this is a mistake and taking it off the endangered species list, Again, this was something that was proclaimed a recovery. Now, all of those are you know, just quick little vignettes uh, of the more than half the things that have been called uh, recoveries but actually aren't. And not only is it important because the, the program's implementation isn't being accurately reflected to the public, uh, but also because it's, I think, indicative of a larger problem with the Endangered Species Act, that there's a lot more species on that list that really shouldn't be. And as kind of a simple test, um, before I came down here today, I looked up uh, through my notes trying to identify species that numbered in the millions. Uh, 
that are on the endangered species list, like Ash Meadows Century and Ash Meadows Gum Plant. There's both at least four million. The Heliotrope Milk Vetch, two million. Painted Snake Coiled Forest Snail, 1.5 million. Penland Beard Tongue, 1.4 million. The National Nashville Crayfish, 700 to 1.2 million in part of its range, and the Nellie Cory Cactus, one point greater than 1 million. Um, that's a pretty simple measure, but you get the idea that um, rarity uh, or being right on the brink of the ex of extinction isn't necessarily isn't necessary to qualify for inclusion on the Endangered Species Act. In the process of Going through and looking at all these species, I read an innumerable uh, three column small type uh, federal register notices. And um, after doing it for a while, you gain insight to certain things and you know where you, where you should look. Um, one of the things that I, I learned to do was watch for words like appear, impossible, and may. And, uh, just actually start running searches for those. And often they were clues that, hey, there's, there's more to this story than one might glean from quickly reading the regulation. Another thing that you discover is that uh, often if there's no population uh, given in, in the regulation or within other documents called five-year reviews, in some cases, that means that the population isn't so small that you can't find it, it might be the reverse. And if you take the density or the, um, the distribution of the species where it's supposed to occur and uh, how many species are supposed to occur per acre or per meter of stream, and you do the multiplication, you often come out with a big number, not a small one, and that's missing from the reports. The, another conclusion you come to is that in many instances, what's being listed is not really the plant or animal, but a piece of land uh, or some sort of human activity. Um, that's really what's becoming endangered, that the, the plant or animal is being used as a device to invoke regulatory authority. Um, now, there, I, I think there's well over 100 people in, in just the one branch of the Fish and Wildlife Service that goes through. and produces these listing and delisting de regulations in critical habitat. Um, that's probably close to or more than the number of all the politicals in the entire Department of Interior, which has multiple agencies to oversee. And so I believe it's probably a pretty difficult thing to police. Uh, and one of, I, I wanted to kind of walk you through and show you uh, a couple of examples of species that are uh, now uh, in the queue to be delist delisted on the basis of recovery. One of them is the, uh, a gecko uh, called the Monita gecko found on that island, which is, I think, under 40 acres. It's got 200-foot cliffs. Um, it's uninhabited, pretty inaccessible. And the first time that anybody went out and counted the Monita gecko, they, they walked around here and they turned all, every rock they could find, or find and they basically only found 18 geckos. And so they also found that there were a large number of rats on the island. And the assumption was, oh my gosh, there's not many geckos, there's a lot of rats, the rats are eating the geckos. The problem was is that the Monita gecko is nocturnal. So if you're walking around in the middle of the day, it's going to be very difficult to find it. Uh, it burrows down into deep cracks. And in 2016, they uh, finally did a survey that was proper uh, during the evening, and they came up with an estimate of 5,000 to 10,000 uh, geckos, uh, an apparent, uh, when you read the regulations, population <coughs> increase. In the regulation, it's, it, it reiterates kind of the history of what was done with the gecko and says and states that you know there were five things that we needed to do to take care of the gecko. Um, we needed to uh, see if the rats were preying upon the gecko. We needed to conduct studies on the life history of the gecko. We needed to have a good survey of the number of geckos. We needed to update the plan for the gecko. We needed to ensure that the gecko's habitat was uh, preserved and taken care of. But when you go through and read in detail, you basically find none of those things really happened with, you know, arguably uh, 
the exception of the habitat being uh, protected. But again, it's kind of a fortress. It's an uninhabited 40-acre rock with 200-foot cliffs surrounding it. Um, so while those didn't happen, uh, and if you read through the, the, uh, the entire notice, you'll find that a lot of those kind of conditional words I mentioned uh, pop up a lot. You know, things like seem to be low, not significant, apparent, may have been, apparently, apparently, apparent. Uh, it's everywhere. And ba when, you, when you look at those words, what you discover is that they realize that there, there were no uh, legitimate surveys of the gecko done until the year before it was proposed for delisting. So there's really no data whatsoever to show that the gecko ever declined, uh, that it was any different when it was in population number, when it was added to the list, and when it was taken off. And there was also really no data to support the idea that rats were preying upon the geckos. It was all supposition. Uh, yet. Uh, there's a Federal Register propo notice proposing to delist the gecko. It hasn't been delisted yet. And it, as you'll see, it comes to the conclusion that uh, a campaign to go out and eradicate those rats worked. Yes, the rats were eradicated. It was probably good for the seabird colony that nests on the island. But uh, there's no evidence whatsoever, again, that it affected the gecko or the gecko population increased. And, uh, in any case, the agency is planning on hailing the gecko as another success. Here's a, another example. That plant is called uh, gypsum wild buckwheat. And um, my instinct is that, uh, in part, it may have been listed because it grows where gypsum is. And people mine for gypsum. And you can see when it was added to the list back in 1980, there were uh, 2,800 of the plants estimated in, in the total population. Uh, a few years later, uh, by the uh, time of the recovery uh, plan was drafted, you see that the plan calls for preserving all 10,000 of the, uh, the gypsum wild buckwheats that are in existence. So the number has already increased, and it didn't increase due to recovery activities. It was um, better field surveys uh, found that there were more plants. So we've gone from 2,800 to 10,000. Uh, by 1984. A year later, uh, two additional populations are discovered. One is 16,000, and another is 18,000. So we've grown pretty dramatically from 2,800 plants. And then you can see by 2007, the agency conducted something called a five-year review. It's something you're supposed to do every five years. Uh, remember this plant was listed in 1980. So it was 27 years uh, later. And when they conducted that uh, review, they came to the conclusion that we ought to delist the species. And if you look a little further down on the left side where it's yellow and explains why, it says original data for classification and error, one of those three bases on which something can be delisted. Shortly after that, uh, there was uh, a petition to delist it, I think, from Pacific Legal, actually. And um, the, it was five years later, actually. And what the Fish and Wildlife Service chose to do, rather than delist it, already having reached this conclusion that it was a data error in its five-year review, they chose to initiate another five-year review. And in the second five-year review, somehow they came to an entirely different conclusion that it should be delisted because it's recovered. Um, and uh, in June of 2017, a uh, proposed rule went out to take this species off the list on the basis that it had been recovered. Uh, I think these are, are kind of pretty easy to follow examples of things that most people would come to the conclusion that this particular activity is a demonstration of a successful conservation program. Yes, it's worthwhile going out and counting these things. Um, but in, we, and you kind of want to ask, well, in some of these instances, shouldn't we count before we go through the process of uh, putting something on the endangered species list? Just the, just the process of going through those regulations designating critical habitat can be tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then the regulations kick in. 
and um, costs are imposed upon other agencies and uh, landowners where these species occur. So uh, basically what you should have learned is when we're talking about saving endangered species, sometimes the species aren't really endangered. Sometimes they're not really e even species, that they're, they're taxonomically invalid. Uh, and unfortunately, in half the cases, uh, or better, uh, of the things that we've proclaimed as success, that we've saved, uh, they really are mistakes. And uh, to have an informed discussion and ad address the problems of the Endangered Species Act, the first step is to, to recognize when the program's not working and it's kind of one of those 12-step programs. If you, if you don't admit you have a problem, you're not <laughs> going to be able to fix it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. Um, you may not know this about Rob Gordon, but uh, he has a background uh, in biology of going into the wilderness in South America to study species distributions and to explore the blank spots on the map. So it gives them a astute understanding of biology, ecology, and taxonomy, which uh, obviously we've spoken about today. Uh, Rob is also a bit of a survivor, and you may not know this either, that uh, during those explorations to South America, there was a major earthquake, and the bus that Rob was on were supposed to be on, was taken out by the landslide, the roads were cut off, he was given up for dead, but he walked out of the wilderness a week later, so <laughs> durability counts. Um, as for myself, uh, I'll explain a little bit about my background and how I got into this and some of my experiences with the ESA early on in my career that have influenced some of my thinking later on. And um, I began my career as a biologist working on endangered species. And as a long-term student of the Endangered Species Act in 1980, working on peregrine falcon recovery in California, uh, I was a newly minted biologist at a UC Santa Cruz. Um, and I got a job at the uh, Santa Cruz Predatory Bird Research Group as a rock climbing biologist. Um, I was already an accomplished Yosemite climber, having climbed El Cap four times. Uh, during those uh, spring breaks out of uh, college. Um, our job was to be very hands-on and to try to turn the tide on what was uh, arguably a species that shouldn't have been sliding to extinction but was at the time. DDT uh, and the metabolite DDE uh, were affecting the eggshell gland of these birds. So the eggshells, like those on bald eagles and pelicans, were becoming increasingly thin, and so it necessitated that we climb to an nest, recover these thinned eggs, bring them back to the laboratory, hatch them in the lab to start a captive breeding population, put healthy chicks back out into the wild. We're lifeboating the species while we solved other problems. Um, and this was really an age of can-do in endangered species, and I'll contrast that with what I consider to be the age of can't-do that we're in presently. These were <clears throat> all-out efforts, muddy boots, all hands on deck at whatever the cost. And my initiation on the first day into the field was standing on the edge of a cliff on the Big Sur coast, having waded through a virtual ocean of poison oak to get there. And uh, threw our, we threw our ropes over the side to start to rappel down to find the nest. And I was instructed, if you fall, you fall on your face, not on your back, because you're expendable, but these eggs are not. And there were 12 known breeding pairs in California at the time. Uh, there were probably more, but it was a pretty severe situation. So we took great personal risks, great pride in those risks, uh, regardless of the challenge, and we had a, we can do this attitude. We can do this, no matter what the challenge. And that led to ever greater challenges and successes along the way. So um, for example, Yosemite National Park called and they said, oh, we have a peregrine nest on El, on El Capitan on the face. It's about 1,400 feet up the cliff. Uh, would you mind checking to see if uh, the eggshells there are thin? They fledged a couple of young, but we're, uh, we're concerned. So we said, sure, we can do this. So we climbed to this nest, uh, took three days uh, sleeping on the cliff to reach the nest. 
and then we continued on to the top of the cliff. And based on that data, uh, it was determined that the eggshells were very, very marginal and likely to fail. So the next year, the next challenge came. Park Service called and said, can you climb to that nest and can you um, recover the eggs and put chicks in the nest so we can fledge some chicks and start to establish them in the park and in the Sierras? And we said, yeah, we can do that, no problem. Um, but we hadn't quite worked out the logistics of that operation. Uh, long short of it is that we set up a relay race, a rock climbing, speed climbing relay race of two climbers going ahead and then me following behind um, with two healthy peregrine falcon chicks in my pack. The mission was to get to the nest within 30 minutes, 1,400 feet up the wall, uh, following behind my speed climbers. We snatched the eggs, put them in an um, incubator, brought them back down to the cliff, left the chicks uh, in, on the ledge, and pulled our ropes behind us. And it was a success. You know, it was that can-do attitude at the time. Um, and, and then you know, that, that mission accomplished uh, led to yet another challenge. A few years later, the National Park Service called again, and they said, oh, now we have a peregrine nest on Half Dome, but it failed failed to produce chicks. And so we were, were thinking that you know, they're, either the eggs were too thin or more likely base jumpers, you know, those folks that like to leap off of large cliffs and deploy their parachutes on the way down. They were, they were certain that base jumpers had caused the failure of the nest because the birds startled. So um, I said, no problem. We can do this. And I recruited two uh, of my daring uh, Yosemite colleagues to go up there with me. And we spent 12 days to reach the nest. And we got the data. We found that, in fact, the nest had not failed because of eggshell thinning. The head nest had not failed because of base jumpers. In fact, they never laid any eggs at all that year. The female went through all the motions. They did food exchanges and everything, but actually they didn't lay any eggs. Rare occurrence, but it did happen. But it was the importance of, of getting the data so we could exclude. You know, hypothesis testing is about excluding hypotheses, so we could exclude that. Well, we weren't the only ones involved in this effort. Tom Cade at Cornell University had cranked up the major captive breeding program uh, there in order to reestablish populations on the East Coast. He was hybridizing peregrine falcon species in order to produce a stronger peregrine falcon for reintroduction into the wild. Be considered horror today to do that, but um, very successful. Uh, so, you know, success required this can do attitude going after the problems uh, because you gathered the data in the first place to figure out what the problems were. Were we successful? Well, the peregrine was delisted in uh, 19, uh, 19, 1999. And uh, the last estimate I was able to find in the literature, 2016 paper, estimated the population in North America at 80,000. And that doesn't include the 11 to 60,000 that were estimated to be on the Mississippi Flyway, uh, many of which would like to um, uh, roost on structures along the coast, including oil rigs out in the uh, Gulf. So, you know, great success there. We applied it to the California condor. That was a desperate situation. Based on data from taking uh, cameras into the wild and photographing every condor we ever saw and then lining up all the photographs so we could get individual IDs based on plumage, we found there were 27 birds left in the wild and that they were dying from lead poisoning and from ravens eating their eggs. So we had to bring them into captivity. And so you know, it was a combination of that data and can-do uh, attitude that now today leads to 463 condors in the wild as of last year, 290, uh, 463 total, 290 in the wild. So data and can-do. So you know, the point of these anecdotes is to emphasize that, uh, and give you a perspective, on a time when we had that roll up our sleeves, can do attitude, let's tackle the problems, let's get on with the business of recovery. Uh, but contrast that now with the, what I consider to be a defeatist attitude of can't do. No, you can't do this, you can't do that. There's a lot of regulation, like Rob had pointed out, may, could, and are all found in that um, literature and uh, in those federal decisions. And there are a lot of restrictions that are just simply, I think, means to an end. Uh, so what, what do we end up with? We have uh, regulation of hypothetical threats as if they're real threats. It could be a problem, so we're going to regulate. Uh, we end up with specious species, specious subspecies, and so-called distinct population segments that uh, populate the list at an increasing rate. 
uh, far-reaching decisions are based upon data that are in error, in some cases fabricated, cherry-picked, and sometimes no data at all. Um, Species subspecies like the so-called Preble's Meadow jumping mouse, coastal California gnat catcher, and the southwestern willow flycatcher continue to be on the list despite the fact that there are new data, new research that showed that they weren't unique in the first place and should never have been on the list in the first place. So I ask you, what are the ultimate consequences of continuing down this path? And I'll venture a prediction. We're going to end up with many healthy populations of common species of things like mice and penstemons, and it's gonna come at the cost of very unique species like blue whales, California condors, rhinos, gorillas. I think that we have a, a problem here with uh, people failing to keep the big picture in mind when setting priorities and basing those priorities on what are thought to be data but are actually really more of opinions. So where do we go wrong and what could be done about it? When asked what uh, one aspect of the ESA I would change, my answer consistently is just make sure that all the data used in these decisions is publicly available. That way we have a common currency of accountability available to the entire nation. Uh, we don't have to worry about administrative drift going on. Uh, it allows for a reset. It allows us to objectively prioritize our efforts. So you might ask, who would be against transparency? Um, well, here, here we go in their own words, uh, so I'll protect the guilty. Here are a few quotes. Uh, the data you requested are proprietary. Um, providing the data would further endanger the species. This is a very common red herring you hear all the time, as if the ground traversed by a bighorn sheep 40 years ago is somehow going to put the population at risk. I mean, I admit there are sometimes rare exceptions, but this is not the rule. Uh, we also hear, we are still using those data. In other words, uh, this happens when research program, uh, recovery programs are subverted into becoming research programs, and really they benefit the researchers more than the species. As one biologist uh, said about Delta smelt, Look, more papers hasn't resulted in more delta smelt. We need science, but we don't need to continue down this path. And uh, the, probably the worst case came from, um, science, uh, an, I won't say what state this is in, but uh, <clears throat> we must respect the scientists' right to use these data first. In other words, th their researchers got to come first in the line of getting the information uh, and that the public was a distant second. I've also heard we do not have those data. Well, that's really code for the NGO next door. We actually have the data. Of, they're holding the data, but they're not subject to FOIA. It's happened. Um, and those data may no longer exist. And that was actually on the Sage Grouse uh, program. And, uh, but in fact, those data did exist, and we ended up getting those data uh, under a FOIA. But my favorite excuse was uh, provided by a rogue recovery team member, quote, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service data was deliberately provided in a format that would not facilitate detailed analysis by those unfamiliar with the manner in which the data was collected. You remember Pirates of the Caribbean? You remember Isla de la Morte? The island cannot be found except by those who know where it is. <laughs> well, being very cheeky, we actually uh, FOIA'd and we obtained the data, but we found that they had scrubbed it of important attributes still allowed us to develop a habitat model, and that habitat model showed that 66% of what was considered to be critical habitat for peninsular bighorn sheep was, in fact, non-habitat. Um, and we went on to memorialize those comments uh, and other juicy comments in our scientific rebuttal paper. So uh, even though they uh, scrubbed the data, we were able to use it. So um, in summary, uh, you know, I hope I've left you with the perspective of how we started out in this business and what I think we can get back to. Um, however, it's really important that we have access to the data and why, you might ask. Withholding data does not further the goal of species recovery under the ESA. However, it does keep some people from looking over your shoulder. Uh, reproducibility, as that required in the Information Quality Act, is 
the litmus test of science. If there's no access to the data, there's no opportunity for reproducibility. So we're basing on decisions on something other than science. Listing and delisting de decisions are not based on best scientific information, best scientific and commercial data. So we need the data and the mechanisms for doing this. So we learned uh, on the, in those early years of the ESA that we can set priorities, we can tackle the pressing problems. Uh, we dealt with the major problems facing the Peregrine Falcon um, with DDE and also another pesticide that had DDT as a contaminant in it. We we're able to eliminate those and move forward. But you know, first we need to make sure we have access to the data, uh, full access to that, and also that we re-embrace that can-do attitude that's always been the foundation of success in America. Thank you. So after hearing about Rob's exploits in South America and Dr. Ramey's uh, climbing feats, uh, I find myself thinking, why did I agree to go last? Now, no one's going to be impressed that last week while reading a CBD legal brief, I got a nasty paper cut. <laughs> now, the word hero gets thrown around a lot, but I'm doing my part too. Um, let me start by saying thank you to Rob and the Heritage Foundation um, for both this important paper and for inviting me to be a part of the discussion. Um, I, I think Rob's paper is extremely important for precisely the note he ended on. If you care about endangered species, the most important thing is having the right information and knowing whether what you're doing is working. Hoping for the best is not a recipe for success. Um, and we know what success means for the Endangered Species Act. The statute says it, and I think everyone intuitively gets it, that we care both about preventing extinction and providing for recovery. No one should be happy if species are protected from extinction but remain forever on the precipice and all it would take is a, a slight breeze to push them over that edge. Um, for a long time, we've known uh, that the statute's results have been, at best, a mixed bag. Um, environmental groups like to point out that relatively few species go extinct once they're put on the list, uh, but they prefer not to focus on the fact that so few recover. Um, and I, I think Rob's paper does a good job of explaining that we knew the problem was bad, but it's even worse than we thought. You know, it's one thing to say the recovery is 2%. Cut it in half, and it's, it's you know, even worse. I mean, what are, what are we doing here? Um, I, I think what's most important about Rob's paper is that he persuas persuasively shows that most of the things that we're celebrating under the Endangered Species Act are little more than fake news. We merely discovered that the species were never as rare as we originally thought. Calling that a recovery is like saying you've cured cancer because you've proved that a hypochondrical patient never had it in the first place. Um, that might be good news for that patient, but it doesn't provide any insight that's useful to any patient that actually has cancer, or in this case, doesn't provide any insight that's useful for recovering species that actually are endangered. Um, we need to know whether species are endangered and whether they're truly recovering to figure out what, if anything, might actually work. So how did we get here? I want to slightly um, disagree with something Rob said earlier. He said that really the thing that sets this process um, up is the listing process. And while that's true in terms of the statute as a practical matter, what really drives the Endangered Species Act is people like me. It's all litigation driven. Um, these are not policy decisions made by people who, you know, you know, bureaucrats who have the public interest in mind and are trying to do the best thing they can based on the science. It's special interest groups filing lawsuits. If a species gets on the list, it's because someone wanted to accomplish a goal, realized that if I file a petition and then sue and then sue and then sue, eventually I'll get what I want. And the reality is that the listing process is fundamentally broken. It is completely litigation driven. It's a problem for administrations regardless of political party. You know, it's interesting that the Obama administration had to develop a, a work plan to try to seize some control back over the listing process so that factors like how vulnerable a species is could be considered rather than just which special interest group is yelling the loudest. Um, and the, the flaw there is that the Endangered Species Act creates strong incentives for litigation and bureaucratization, but too weak incentives to promote studying species 
and conserving them. That makes it all but inevitable that people like me, and I think more concerningly, people who are not like me but represent special interest groups that are trying to achieve something that's not uh, in the public interest, get to, to drive the bus. Um, that there, there's no real democratic accountability when all it takes is anyone who is willing to pay the cost of a filing fee to generate a lawsuit gets to dictate national policy. Now, the reason why that happens is relatively clear. The, as soon as a species is listed, that automatically triggers really significant and burdensome regulatory restrictions. Um, that creates a very strong incentive to push for species to be listed for, me, for reasons other than uh, protecting species from extinction. If you don't like timber harvesting, you have a very strong incentive to find something in that forest, um, knowing that if you can make a plausible case that it's threatened, you're going to get to shut down the thing you don't like. And there's pretty powerful evidence that that's happened repeatedly. Um, on the other side of the coin, there's a similar incentive for industry to do the opposite and try to tw twist the science or push the science in a way to suggest that species aren't at risk. Um, and it's just because so much is turns on that scientific question. We're conflating science with policy questions of what should actually happen. Uh, as a result, the scientific process has become incredibly politicized, and we rarely have clean data one way or the other. As a result, decisions have to be made on the basis of incomplete, biased, and otherwise unreliable evidence. Um, one of the things that's always struck me as paradoxical is that um, this problem is actually worse, um, and, and the incentives are strongest for species that are relatively common and widely distributed. Uh, if you're trying to either shut down activity you don't like or reduce regulations to promote activity you do like, you get the most bang for your buck by focusing on the species that are actually the least vulnerable to extinction. Um, and historically, studies have shown that most of the conflicts are precisely those species um, that you know, people are going to war not over the species that might actually go extinct tomorrow, but the species that's, that's abundant and, and can have those huge regulatory effects. Uh, there are many proposals to address this problem, but the first thing is to acknowledge that it exists. Um, I will note that uh, Rob and I have both written, as a complete aside, uh, that there is an opportunity to try to disconnect um, the consequences of a listing from the regulatory restrictions um, by restoring the endangered and threatened uh, distinction in the statute. Uh, others have made similar um, proposals. My law professor, Katrina Wyman at NYU, suggested that we make a clean break from science and politics, allow species to be listed based just on the science, and then let someone who's politically accountable decide what happens next. Don't have any regulations that are automatically triggered uh, by a listing, because that's just inviting uh, politicization. Uh, but back to the status quo. Um, what explains the phenomenon uh, that, that Rob has identified? I, I think it's this politicization problem that, that I've um, been discussing. That if there is a very strong incentive for two sides or two, two special interests to try to influence a bureaucratic process to achieve a result, um, and they know that whatever happens, they will follow it up with endless litigation, that will necessarily distort science and deplete resources we need for conservation. Uh, making matters worse, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in my opinion, has created a double standard. Although the Endangered Species Act says the same standard should apply for listing a species as delisting a species, in practice, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, whenever someone wants to put a species on the list, uh, all of the uncertainty that uh, might be affect that species will be presumed to support the listing. So if you have, if there's almost no data on a species and you come in with just a shred, chances are the service might actually list that. But it takes far more to undo that decision. Uh, the service doesn't look at it with a blank slate and say, okay, what, what does the weight of the evidence say? It starts from the assumption that we're keeping this on the list. Have you eliminated all potential uncertainty? And unless you can meet that much higher burden, chances are uh, the species is staying on. Uh, the Endangered Species Act is, in many ways, like Hotel California. You can check in, but you can never leave. Um, and you know, it, it should disturb all of us, regardless of our views on um, how high a priority protecting species should be, that so few of them seem to, to, to recover, that, that we're falling so far short of achieving um, the statute's goal.
Uh, so I actually had a conversation with an environmentalist friend this morning. In the, I was in South Carolina this morning, and we had to drive to the airport at 4 a.m., and I, I practiced this speech on her to, to some extent. And I asked her, what do you think of this? I mean, you support the Endangered Species Act. You care about species recovery. How do you respond to hearing that as many as more than half of the alleged recoveries weren't real, that they, they were data errors? And I was not too surprised, but a little surprised that so early in the morning she was immediately able to say that that's either a good thing or, at uh, worst, a, a necessary evil. Um, for her and her values, the fear of extinction is so much more important than the fear that some farmer who isn't her is going to bear this unnecessary regulation that she would say, you know, if there's any uncertainty, apply the precautionary principle, list the species. And I, I, that is a common belief in the environmental community, and I can understand the intuition behind it, but it's ultimately not in the interest of conservation. It misses that having species on the list that don't belong there and leaving them long past the time they should be taken off detracts from the resources we need to um, promote recovery of the species that really do need it. Um, and Rob's paper does a good job of documenting some of those costs. Um, Merely listing a species and imposing regulations, history has shown, it is not all that helpful at recovering species. It's possible it does serve as a, a preventative against extinction, but the work of recovering species is the hard part. That's what takes the, the positive efforts to grow habitat or deal with the, the problem of the eggs that might not hatch because they're too thin. Um, and, and that's what we're missing, that's, and that's what should be uh, at the front of our minds, is how do we get those resources to, to spur that sort of action. And the reality is federal resources to promote recovery are inherently subject to limits, um, that they are going to be scarce. Um, so do we think it's a good idea to squander those scarce resources in this dysfunctional listing process unnecessary monitoring for species that didn't recover but were listed for data error, um, endless litigation, or even conservation efforts on species that are so numerous and widely distributed they don't really need those efforts. Um, increasingly, left-leaning biologists and, and environmental activists are realizing that the way we allocate resources in the ESA just isn't working. Um, it, it makes sense as a, pol a political matter. The money goes to the charismatic species that people like feeling that they're supporting, but it doesn't go based on the risks that species actually face and where that money can, can have the most bang for the buck. And this is, this is what Rob has identified as part of that problem, is that we're, we're wasting resources rather than focusing on where they could best be spent. <clears throat> the other um, aspect of this, this double standard, that it's easier to get species on the list and hard to get species off the list, is that I, I think it perfectly explains why we so often seem to have these data errors. And, and Rob identifies hundreds, or I think it's maybe 200 or 100 potential more, 100 more where that has happened, which is a very high percentage of the um, species that are listed. Um, and, and the reason for it is that, uh, that double standard. If you are s supporting the listing of a species, you have very little incentive to do a full survey and get that perfect maximum information, because you know that uncertainty is your friend at that point. That, that the service is going to look at and say, well, we have a little bit, of sh a few shreds, we don't really know the whole situation, let's put it on the list to be safe. Um, it's not until a species is on the list and someone has to get that much higher burden of eliminating all the uncertainty and doing all the studies that anyone bothers to go out and look. And, and that should concern all of us um, because it inherently means that listing decisions aren't being made based on science, they're being made on a policy judgment of you know, when in doubt, put the species on the list. And that's probably not the best way to spend our scarce resources. Um, to give you a sense for how this works and, and the role litigation plays in it, I do want to talk about one particularly stark example of the double standard. And it's one that uh, Dr. Ramey mentioned earlier, the California gnat catcher. Um, but first, to, in the interest of disclosure, PLF is involved in, in litigation over that species, challenging the listing. Um, the California population of the gnat catcher was listed in 1991 based on one of, based on conflicting studies, some of which suggested that the part of the population in California was its own subspecies because it had slightly different coloring in its feathers uh, on its tail and a few other morphological characteristics. 
There were competing studies saying that actually those characteristics were just natural variation species, and you found them in Mexico and in California, and there was no real separation. Um, but in 1991, when the service made this decision, it said, this is all we have to go with. We're picking the study that says this is a subspecies and can be listed. But it acknowledged that science might prove us wrong and that we will have to consider the taxonomic work once it's actually done to see whether this species should be taken off the list. Well, in 2000, that work was done. Uh, Dr. Robert Zink and several co-authors, including the, the, the person who wrote the study that the service originally relied upon, published a mitochondrial DNA study showing that the California population isn't genetically distinct, that this is all one uh, species. Um, but in 2011, note that's 11 years later, in those 11 years there was a petition and several rounds of litigation to force a response, uh, the service refused to list the species based on this um, best scientific evidence. It did so because it said, well, we've already found that's the subspecies. Have you m met that Herculean standard to prove that we were absolutely wrong? Um, and what they said is that mitochondrial DNA study, while it's great, on its own doesn't remove any possible doubt that there might be some future study done that supports us. So based on that speculative hypothetical that, and they actually mentioned an example, maybe there will someday be a nuclear DNA study uh, that will support our subspecies finding. Well, uh, in 2013, Dr. Zink accepted that, um, that challenge and did a nuclear DNA study, which once again indicated the California population is not a subspecies. Yet three years later, in 2016, once again after a petition and, and several lawsuits, the service declined to withdraw the listing. But this time, the agency learned its lesson. Its response to the petition was very interesting. Instead of saying that there might be some study, some particular study down the road that might support our position, it instead, instead decided to make a purely ad hoc decision. It said that there is no agreed legal or scientific understanding of what a subspecies is. So that means we get to make it up. Um, and in this case, we've decided it's a subspecies, and we don't know why. Uh, and the most interesting part was there was an explicit disclaimer in there saying, but this analysis doesn't necessarily apply to any other species. So the next time a petition comes up with a bird, and we want to reach the opposite conclusion, we're reserving uh, the right to make that arbitrary ad hoc uh, decision. Now, why do I recount this example? Part of it is just because it is one of the starkest cases of that double standard, that very little science got the species on the list, and increasingly it just takes more and more and more, and perhaps there is no point at which you can convince the service that the, those straps are wrong. Um, the other reason is that species listings, errant species listings matter. The critical habitat designation for the gnat catcher will cost an estimated $5 billion over 20 years. Uh, these decisions and errors have huge impacts. Uh, the other thing I, I can't say I like about the gnat catcher case, but it, it's that it's helpful to realize is just how incredibly slow everything goes. In 1991, they acted based on a few scraps of data. In 2000, we got good science to show that that, that decision was wrong. It is 2018, and we're still relying on those scraps of data from 1991. Uh, that the intervening 18 years of several petitions and several lawsuits um, have just resulted in delay. We haven't actually managed to get a decision. Uh, and you, you see that in the examples that Rob mentions, that species that they can, the service can say, oh, it's recovered, relying on nothing more than post hoc ergo proctor hoc. We listed it a while ago, we didn't do anything or pay any attention, and now we realize it's, it's really popular. That must be because we recovered it. Um, and the answer is no, it's just you're really, really slow at looking at species and trying to figure out whether what to do and, and whether it works. And that slowness is, is also a problem, and it's reflective of the fact that resources are being um, wasted on species that shouldn't be on the list in the first place. Um, so I am a lawyer, so I will close with um, what are the litigation opportunities here? Um, I don't know if there are other lawyers in the room, but the ESA is litigation driven. So if you want change, that means you're filing a lawsuit. Um, and I, I think perhaps long term, one of the most interesting parts of Rob's paper is the identification of the 100 species that likely shouldn't be on the list today based on data error. Um, that is something that people should mine for litigation opportunities. It will be hard, because as I said, the service uh, refuses to accept uh, reality and will will avoid making the decisions whenever it's possible. Courts don't want to scrutinize this stuff because they're like me. They went to law school, so they didn't have to do science or math or any of that hard stuff. So they don't want to review it. They want to rely on Chevron deference. 
Um, that's why it's so essential that the Department of Interior and Fish and Wildlife Service get involved here and recognize that you know, we need to look at all this with fresh, fresh eyes and figure out what are we doing, is it working? Um, and that, that should matter to all of us who care about protecting and recovering species, including those federal bureaucrats. Uh, we have to begin with a sober assessment of where we are and what the problems are. Um, only then can we figure out what, if anything, we've done has worked or what we need to be doing instead. And, and Rob's paper is an important first step in starting to analyze those issues. Thank you. Well, thank you. Those were outstanding uh, presentations. We, we do want to have a time for Q&A. Uh, I realize we've gone a little bit over our time here, so if people have to leave, we'll understand that. But if you can stay, I think you'll find it's a very, it'll be a very uh, good discussion. If you have questions, get them organized and ready, but I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask the first one. In fact, the first two. Um, first of all, Dr. Ramey, Mr. Gordon. How realistic is it that the Fish and Wildlife Service can actually count the number of endangered species that there are um, in the field? Um, well, I, I, in, in a, it depends if you're looking in a macro sense or micro sense. You know, uh, with, with some species, like a black bear, uh, I think we can go out and we can get pretty good estimates how many black bears there are. Um, but if you're dealing with invertebrates, for example, and the act, was, act doesn't distinguish. I mean, uh, species include subspecies, and that can be a subspecies of a black bear or a subspecies of a beetle. Um, with beetles, nobody knows how many beetles there are in North America. Uh, I've looked at uh, one guide that speculated maybe 10,000. And that was at the species level. If you divide all those down into smaller and smaller categories, into subspecies, there's going to be very few people who are able to recognize them. Uh, in fact, uh, one, one of the um, invertebrates I looked at for the, the paper was uh, Delhi Sands Flower Loving Fly, uh, which some people may have heard of. Uh, it's a, a fly that occurs in California, and actually, uh, because it was a scene at the site where a hospital wing was going to be built. Uh, I think they had to move the wing to, a, to, a, to another location. It's a pretty expensive venture. And I don't know if one person saw three flies or uh, one person saw one fly three times. Um, but whoever that person was for it to count, they actually had to have a permit from the Fish and Wildlife Service that recognized that their observation of a fly was valid. That is, if you don't hold the permit um, you, and you say, well, I saw this fly here, it wouldn't really count. There's, there's so few people uh, who can actually recognize that fly. And we, when you get into things that aren't what we call charismatic, charismatic fauna or flagship species, there's so few people who uh, know of them, never mind are able to distinguish them in the field. And, and figure out, OK, this particular fairy shrimp, how plentiful is it compared to other fairy shrimp? There's, there's a lot of them. You know? Is one going up while the others are going down? Um, it, you know, the, it, it's difficult enough to have point data uh, on, on some of these species, never mind having trend data, meaningful trend data, which you, you really need to have to uh, assess uh, whether the species is, is becoming, uh, coming closer to extinction. There are a lot of good people at the service. Um, some of my counters friends and colleagues, but um, they're overextended, for one thing. So they, they can't go out <clears throat> by themselves, although I, I encourage all of them to be out of the office as much as possible and into the field because it's important to be in touch with what's going on in nature. So the service, by necessity, has to rely on other studies. And so that goes back to my main point that that means the data needs to be public as long and the methods so that we can validate it. And you know, sure, they can get some from permitted people, but a lot of it's going to come from independent researchers in the universities. So we have to be able to vet that. So uh, you know, what's the old saying? Trust but verify. You know, that, that applies there. If I could add one other thing, just kind of put it in perspective. Um, some time ago, I think the estimate of uh, gorillas was 
around 50,000. And some of the people researching gorillas were, were told by locals, hey, there's, there's gorillas in this particular area that you haven't really uh, looked at. And I think they were skeptical about it, and, and, but they, they went and they looked and they found, lo and behold, uh, maybe 125,000 more gorillas. Uh, they more than doubled the population. And we're talking an animal that's big enough to be seen by satellite. Uh, with some of the things we're talking about, uh, like fairy shrimp, which I mentioned, uh, their eggs can survive uh, a decade or more desiccated essentially in a state of suspended animation, blown around in the wind. They can pass through the stomach uh, uh, of uh, cattle and survive the, uh, the acidic conditions there, and then land in some dirt, and when it rains, um, uh, hatch and complete their life cycle in a couple of weeks. Um, that kind of thing is going to be a little bit tougher to track than the bighorn sheep uh, or lions that someone like Rob works on. Let me, let me just add real quick okay. that this, this issue of trends is really important. Mm -hmm. The po populations in the wild naturally fluctuate for lots of different reasons, you know, parasites, but also climatic variation, you know, i.e. the weather, sage-grouse being a case in point. And so <clears throat> if the service or someone is making a decision and the population is heading for its low cycle, like the sage-grouse are at the time of its next decision, then the conclusion is going to be, oh gosh, you know, they're in peril, they're declining, but you know, it's part of the bigger trend. You have to look back over the bigger trend and have the data to understand what drives those trends. Very good. Okay, questions from the audience. So right here and then we'll go to you. Dr. Mayer, would you comment on the lack of, prioritiz lack of prioritization in the ESA? I mean, it seems to me from the very beginning, if they really wanted to save uh, the rarest and most unique genetic material and species on the planet, there would have been some system uh, of prioritizing what you're going to save, because you can't save everything. You don't have the, the money, the manpower, and the time. And so there'd be some emphasis on saving uh, the most unique genetic material, and a lot of that would be uh, monotypic taxa. You would go for a family with one genus, a genus, and one species, a species with no subspecies. And, and yet most of the emphasis has been on on listing and working on the most, some of the most common genetic material. I mean, species that are doing so well that they've subspeciated, they've got different populations everywhere, uh, across wide areas, across the nation, uh, across the world. I mean, they're listing horn larks. There are 50 subspecies across the world. Uh, kangaroo rats, uh, uh, jumping mice. And things where there's just minuscule differences between one subspecies and another. And what they're really doing is, is not saving any unique genetic material or anything rare. They're just stopping a, a, house develop, a housing development in Southern California or uh, uh, a dairy farmer cleaning a ditch in, in uh, Denver or something like that. I mean, what does that say about the whole act and, and, and you know, the guys who wrote it and what they were really trying to get at? Well, they were going after the, the very apparent extinctions that were happening at the time when it was written. There were the amendments, I can't remember if it was uh, 78 or 82, that set a prioritization system, but it's really highly ineffective and it's really not used now uh, to any meaningful ends. <clears throat> they have a priority ranking, but that's not how the money's spent or the <clears throat> effort settling or fighting litigation. Uh, instead, we have to look overseas. We have to look to the Zoological Society of London. They have the EDGE program, Evolutionarily Distinct and Globally Endangered program. They have a ranking list in for mammals and birds. They're working on the uh, insects now. Um, <clears throat> based on their degree of evolutionary uniqueness, those, those really deep branches of the evolutionary tree for which there's you know, one twig left, that's the really unique species, the iconic ones like the condors. Um, those get a higher ranking than something that's very common, like the Meadow jumping mouse, which is like number 4,200 something on the list. Um, <clears throat> so there's that prioritization. It's established. It focuses on species. Uh, and so, you know, species first is where I would argue it. Uh, there's also uh, researchers in Australia, Madeline Bottrell's group, and they wrote a, a controversial paper on conservation triage. You know, we, it's like battlefield medics trying to save soldiers. You can't do it all. And so you have to triage. 
And so they have a systematic way of approaching this based on your probability of success. So you combine something like that with your edge program in London, then I think you could have a much more effective prioritization. But we're not doing any of that. No. No. Okay, right here in the center. Identify yourself. If you yeah, uh, Ben Murray, U.S. Senate. I really appreciate you guys coming out and talking about this. Very, very insightful. Um, wish I could ask five or ten questions, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with what I consider to be a primary question. Um, so, so say a, a, a question of, of first principles, let's say something like that, right? Um, something that comes up often in this discussion, and I'm just, I'm just learning about this and looking at it from a policy perspective, right? Um, the co economic costs, right, is something that's come up over and over and over, and, and it seems like a problem that nobody can figure out quite how to tackle, including me. Um, and I started looking into this a little deeper, and, and what I realized is that nobody's asking the first questions. And, and, and to go really to the beginning, the question is, why does government exist, right? And the next question is, answering that question is, does ESA serve that purpose, right? And the next question is really what everybody else is asking. And, and, and it's actually the question that you guys answered very well during this presentation, which is, OK, is ESA doing that well, right? And if you look at the findings of the ESA in the beginning, Congress finds that, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's, Congress finds that human action is causing extinction or leading, potentially leading to extinction. And sorry, I hate, I hate when people ask questions and give a lecture, and here I am doing it. But, um, you know, and then, okay, we should, we should try to preserve species, right? But why does government exist? It exists for human beings. It exists to preserve the common good or something like that, right? If, and then if government exists to preserve the common good or human welfare or something to, along those lines, right? The next question is, before you say, well, we should preserve a species, is does preserving species always necessarily promote human welfare or the common good in any way, right? That's a question, maybe it's an absurd question, maybe there's an easy answer. Maybe it's not asked because it's politically incorrect to ask it, right? But I, I was reading, I was thumbing through your, through your background and you talked about the Lake Erie snake, right? If that subspecies, and you mentioned that there are a ton of those Lake, Lake Erie snakes, so the, the, as a species, they're not even close to endangerment, but the subspecies is, right? If that goes extinct, so another way to put human, uh, economic cost is it's human cost, right? That's what we're really asking. So we're, all, we're all frustrated about like, hey, what about human cost, right? Isn't that why government exists? So if the subspecies of Lake Erie snakes goes extinct, does it matter? And, and this is a question I'm really interested in what all of you have to say about this because you have really different perspectives. And, and Jonathan, you're the one who really kind of touched on it in your talk. But if the Lake Erie subspecies of snake goes extinct, does it matter to us as human beings and should there be something in ESA that requires fish and wildlife to first answer that question, not before they can list, right? Listing should still be scientific, but before we can take action as, as, a, as a government to impose human costs, right? Like, should we be asking that question first? Does this matter to human beings that the species go extinct? Species have gone extinct for a long time. Maybe we're messing things up by trying to prevent it, you know? Should we ask that question or am I, is this totally off base? Okay, let's go. Let's get the answers from the folks. Yeah. Thank you. We actually asked about 40 questions there. <laughs> um, and each one of them uh, we, could, we could dwell on for a while. Uh, I think one of the more important ones is that th there's this assumption that this is a scientific program and it is totally scientifically driven. And um, while parts of it use science um, and I think it's reasonable to make the argument that the determination that something is endangered or not is a scientific one. Uh, the reality is that this is public policy, so it, it should involve, um, it, it involves more than just people implementing and looking at science in terms of choosing what to do. Um, and I'm gonna use this as a, a means to, to go somewhere that I think related to your, your um, question, uh, but very important, and that is that basically right now what happens is, you know, it's publicly popular uh, to engage in saving species, uh, but the public doesn't necessarily bear the cost. Now, we, we, you might think, yes, they do, because they pay for these government agencies to go out and do this. But in reality, what happens is that the farmer, the you know, the, the rural landowner, um, they're essentially paying the cost of a public policy choice to conserve this or that that is supposedly scientifically determined to be endangered. 
if we uh, went out to that farmer's piece of property and we said, hey, this is beautiful and absolutely unique and it should be conserved and preserved, um, the, we, we want to make a national park out of it. Uh, what would happen is that individual would be compensated for that and it would become part of the national park. Right now, um, essentially under the Endangered Species Act, the federal government goes out there and says, you know, we as a policy have decided we're going to conserve this kangaroo rat and it's on your property. And uh, so you can't use it. You're going to bear the cost of something the public wants to do. Um, and I, I think that that essentially creates a, a very contentious and counterproductive um, way of approaching conservation. I think it was Leopold said that if you don't have support of the landowner, um, your conservation program is really not going to succeed. Um, unless somebody else would like to. I, I mean, I, I think I agree with everything about that. To, to answer your first order question, I think ex extinctions are bad. Uh, the natural rate of extinction is never going to be zero, and it's probably incredibly too costly to ever get there. But the loss of that potential cure for whatever, I mean, losing something for, forever is a long time. If something goes extinct, you have lost something. Um, so there's a cost there, there's, but there's also a cost of protecting it. And the challenge is exactly what, uh, what Rob mentioned, is that under the Endangered Species Act, the people who enjoy the benefits don't pay the cost. I think that if they did, the environmental movement and, and most people would still contribute because people do care about the environment. They do care about preventing extinction. Uh, the priorities might change. The balance of the costs and benefits might change. But I, I still think you'd, you'd have something even without the Endangered Species Act. Uh, I, sorry. No. <laughs> Judge Manson, Craig Manson, who was former uh, Assistant Secretary of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, he had this discussion with me and asked that very question uh, in his office, uh, 2004 or five. <clears throat> and after an hour of discussion, we reached the conclusion that you know we as a society value rarity and we value diversity, and so that's why we have an Endangered Species Act. And you know I think we need an Endangered Species Act, but you know it does come down to prioritization, overextend and underachieve, and there it is. If I could just add one thing is you, you mentioned basically the, the preamble uh, of the ESA and um, when you read it you have to read it kind of in the context of the time it was written and um, one of the things that really stands out to me when I go back and, and read it is there isn't a lot of acknowledgement that there there is some natural rate of e extinction um, regardless of human involvement and activity. Uh, it's basically all these things are, are a result of rampant economic development. Um, but when you actually go and you read the recovery plans and the five-year reviews and the listings, you'll find a substantial number of these species. One of the first things that's uh, stated about them is it's a relictual. It's, you know, it's basically survived from the, the Pleistocene. Um, and there may not be a specific action that human beings are taking that it's tipping it over, but you are uh, essentially faced with a, a significant challenge that isn't something that is necessarily human-induced. And, um, you know, we may need to distinguish between those things at some point uh, and, and, and recognize that, uh, you know, some of it may be swimming uphill. Uh, but, to, but to even say that, you, you get kind of vilified, um, I think, Lujan, uh, who was Secretary of the Interior, said, do we have to save every single subspecies? And just by virtue that he posed the question, um, he was just, you know, just destroyed and probably. How okay. dare he ask that question? <laughs> uh, Brian, then Gray, and then we'll move to the back. I'm Brian Seashells, consultant. Um, anyway, just Rob, congratulations. I thought it was a terrific uh, study. Uh, uh, very, very uh, informative, and I, I was reading through it, and it just was sort of this litany of, you know, they list it based on nothing, and then they actually go out and look for it, and uh, lo and behold, its population goes through the roof. Um, so I just, you know, what does that phenomenon just say to you, or, you know, uh, any of you three up there, A, about, and I think you get to this with this list of the hundred or so species in the appendix that are still listed that may take a closer look, uh, warrant a closer look. So I guess what does that say about 
sort of, you know, might this be sort of the tip of the iceberg phenomenon, um, which I think your study suggests, and B, what does this say about, uh, I think, the sort of agency behavior, willingness to kind of, I think, use uh, sort of false and misleading data or sort of label what, you know, things as a recovery that, you know, the Endangered Species Act was totally incidental to their improvement and they didn't really recover, they were just far more numerous. So, you know, how does, you know, how can we evaluate kind of, because there's lots of species that are still listed, 1,600 and some odd, that, you know, or what do you think about those 1,600 when you kind of think about based on what your findings? Um, well, first of all, let me say that it wasn't a, a, a systematic review or, 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 or random, and uh, nor did I look at the entire list. I selected pools of species that I, where I suspected um, I would find uh, evidence of data error. But I think I probably looked uh, somewhere between three and 400 uh, plants and animals, uh, which is, you know, a fraction of the list. And uh, I found a substantial number that were either data errors or um, a number that actually are likely extinct. And I'm not uh, making the, the charge that they went extinct while listed. I think predominantly most of those were extinct before they were, were added to the list. Uh, but I think that the problem is larger than my, uh, my paper indicates. I think I suspect that there's a lot more species uh, on the list that where we had scratched the surface, we find that they were more numerous, um, that uh, some of the threats uh, against them uh, would not be in fact valid, uh, that their uh, taxonomy might be in question. And uh, you, if you read enough of these things, you, you come to the conclusion that people are allowed to put uh, basically assumption and supposition down in the course of formulating regulations. I remember uh, one, one bird I looked at, I think it was the Puerto Rican whippoorwill, where they mentioned some specific activities that they thought were threats to it, and then I think surfing was mentioned. You know, or, you know, it's just some of the times the things that are just tossed in there, and then maybe this, and then maybe this, and then maybe this, um, with little to no basis. And um, as Jonathan mentioned, when it comes time to take that thing off, you somehow have to systematically go back to all these things that were just tossed in uh, and prove, in fact, that they, they don't have any effect. And sometimes it's like proving a negative. It's, it's near impossible. The, the one thing I will add to that is don't just think about the species that are currently on the list. This is a problem with the incentives of the act. There will be many, many, many more species added to the list that don't need its protection. And so the, the potential costs going forward are potentially limitless. It's also still an employment policy for biologists. So. And lawyers. And I'm benefiting lawyers. tremendously from this. <laughs> I, I, actually, one of the problems is, is what we call in the field uh, species cartels. <clears throat> and so, you know, the service will often uh, rely on species experts, you know, people who spent their whole life studying, you know, some obscure a uh, snail or bird or uh, bighorn sheep, for example, a population, that their whole career wrapped around it. And, uh, you know, really, that's the last thing you should do in terms of uh, be getting an independent opinion. Uh, the National Science Foundation, for example, when they form their panels, they try to get uh, people <coughs> with diverse expertise around similar questions in order to have new ways of looking at the problem. So that's a way to introduce accountability at the start is, don't have people involved or have strongly vested interests. You might want one or two, but you, you really have to have a, a more diverse group. And then the second, of course, is comes down to the data. You know, if everybody can look at the data, you know, at least we can have a debate and discussion. And you're going to see some level of, I don't know, crowdsourcing or, or people reanalyzing data sets in order to uh, see if the claims are valid that are made from those. Okay, Greg, and then we'll move on and, you know, Let's make our questions as short as possible because we are running out of time here. First, thank you all for a very insightful um, conversation. I want to ask if I could for you to drill down just a teeny bit more on this critical issue of the trend, which all three of, <clears throat> excuse me, all three of you um, mentioned, because it's kind of a double-edged sword. All the years that we have spent trying to 
encourage them to publish delisting criteria on a bunch of species so that we would know where the light is at the end of the tunnel and so we could direct policy that way. We have frequently asked them, how do you know it's endangered if you don't know how many of them there used to be, for which they have no answer on most of the listed species. The reverse may also be true, though, which is how do you delist, now that we've got 1,600 of them on the list, how do you delist a species if you don't know how many there are supposed to be because you never knew how many there were in the first place? They, in other words, that same question can be asked of us as we pressure for delisting now. How do you get at the trend when there was no good baseline to begin with? Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's a legitimate question, but with uh, a lot of these species, you find that after they get listed, data is accumulated by virtue of the fact that people are concerned about regulations and, you know, take and uh, going through consultation, and it, it basically uh, puts the onus on other parties to abide by the law to collect the data to tell, tell us how many of these things are. I think that's why in a lot of instances, we find out uh, ex post facto that the species is more plentiful or more widely dispersed. And there have been enough of those instances where we could be delisting species for many, many years before we bumped up against some for which we were, were lacking data. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a pool of candidates there. Uh, I think the I think over time, basically, the service, though, has been greatly more interested in adding to the list rather than subtracting to the list. And one of the simple things I think should be done is uh, maybe in the budget, there, there shouldn't be one line item called listing. Uh, there should maybe be listing, and there should be delisting. And um, there should be, uh, I'd love to see this administration focus on that, that delisting element. I've got another idea. How about make people pay or give them a choice to pay more to expedite reviews? So if industry is willing to make that pay and in, environmentalists aren't, that might give you a signal about what the underlying values are and what they're trying to accomplish. Some of the environmental groups are <clears throat> doing well. Mm -hmm. um, they can afford it. Yeah. Anyway, I would focus on uh, the definition and try to seek a quantifiable definition for reasonably foreseeable future. Will this species become, or subspecies or distinct population, become endangered or threatened in the reasonably foreseeable future? That's not defined. 30 years? I mean, that's sort of reasonable foreseeable future for, I think, most people. But uh, there's no definition, and so it's entirely open to interpretation. And when things are open to interpretation, you get drift, administrative drift, and a lot of subjectivity. So. Um, I think we could define that and say 30 years, or whatever you want. Then I think we can measure to a standard. It doesn't really matter so much as to how many there were. It's what is going to be there going forward. And uh, you know, obviously, the predictions 100 years out are you know, completely erroneous. Otherwise, we'd all be playing the stock market. OK, right there, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for the presentation. A question from, from a layperson. Sometimes when you can't count, you employ the precautionary principle. You know, you don't, you don't want to scale the hill. You don't want to mess around in the mud to look for salamanders or whatever. Is there a way in which the, your profession for the, the scientists could appeal to other branches of science th to put some closer sidebars on the precautionary principle, because it seems as though where we can't count, we, we fall into policy. I don't, I, I don't know if that, the question makes sense, but is there a way of looking at flaws in the precautionary principle through appeals to other branches of science as a means, a means, not by no means the only one, to impose more rigor on the estimating process and the counting process for the purpose of establishing species populations, species trends, and so forth. That's a tough one, and, and here is the issue, uh, is that uh, in scientific papers and reports, uh, you know, you'll have uh, introduction uh, methods, data collection, data analysis, results, discussion, which is some of the interpretations. And inevitably, uh, in that discussion section, you have opinion data. And those opinions, I mean, it's basically when somebody does a literature review, uh, 
uh, they tend to just read the introduction and conclusions of a paper, and, and as a result, they end up with you know, an opinion survey across the board. So dependent upon what the, you know, the political motivations are of that individual, um, that gets interpreted as being science, when actually it's just their, their opinions expressed at the end of the paper. Um, I think it's more of a policy question. You know, there was that debate on Director's Order 100 in the National Park Service as to whether precautionary principle was going to be used as a guiding mechanism for natural resource management in the parks. And unfortunately, that is gone now. I was glad to see that. Precautionary principle invites too much subjectivity into the process. It's not a part of US environmental law. And I don't think it should because of the opportunity for misuse by whoever. So I just agree with Rob that I'm not a fan of the precautionary principle. And uh, you know, there's better tools like uh, cost benefit analysis and risk assessment. And uh, with regard to listing, uh, there's things that can be done administratively. Um, uh, I, I think we need to somehow uh, ensure that there are, are greater teeth uh, to the Data Quality Act um, and that the, the standards that are used <laughs> are um, stricter. Some of these things, however, are you know, inherent problems with the law and the way it's written. Um, for example, use distinct population segments. I think uh, the uh, Congress um, advised the agency to use that term selectively, but it's basically been uh, treated as a binary choice. Something either is or isn't endangered as a distinct population. Well, how do you exercise? Uh, you know, how do you how do you use that in a restricted manner if you're going to be sued for not listing it? Um, so there, there's inherent flaws with the law, uh, but there are some things that can be done administratively, and um, while they won't make it perfect, there's so much, Im so much room for improvement um, that we can, we can accomplish a lot. Okay, let's move to the back. Uh, we've got two more questions there. Bonico and the Committee for Constructive Tomorrow, National Center for <laughs> Public Policy Research. Uh, Rob Boyd Ramey emphasized the importance of having access to the data. Yesterday, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt announced a rulemaking within his agency uh, that would uh, ensure that uh, r rules and regulations issued by EPA were not based on what he referred to as secret science. In other words, the data, the underlying data uh, would have to be made public and be subject to public review. Now, that was something that was within EPA only, and EPA doesn't have jurisdiction over the Endangered Species Act. But in the absence of a fundamental reform of the, e of the ESA, which, however desirable, is politically not likely anytime soon, is such an approach within uh, the Department of Interior, namely through the rulemaking process, to, uh, to ensure, to the extent possible, that we do have access to the data upon which uh, listing decisions are made? Is that something that the three of you think should be pursued as a way of breaking up the uh, log jams that slow up the process and make it so you know, absurdly long. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just say I, I think uh, underlying data and um, methodology uh, used to uh, codify regulations ought to be available to the public. And um, so I, I, would, I would welcome uh, anything that required that. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's currently re uh, required by National Institute of Health that any of their, uh, any of the science produced by their research grants, that data has to be public, uh, you know, except when there's, you know, some sensitive information relative to patients, uh, that those may require uh, non-disclosure agreements. And, you know, you look at any research university, Yale, MIT, Harvard, they all have a data share agreement for very, very sensitive data. So, you know, the trick is you, you have to have a few exceptions, but not one so big you could drive a truck through them. So, you know, absolutely a great move. And there's already a precedent. And in fact, in the scientific field, you're seeing more and more journals require that data be put into uh, the Data Dryad National Science Foundation funded archive. 
And so um, we're seeing that, but unfortunately we're not seeing that fast enough. And also some journals give exceptions for endangered species, no matter what the data is, if it's not location data. So uh, yes, we need to go there. And we also need to go there with uh, getting some teeth in the Information Quality Act. Those three sentences are meaningful. It's just that they have no teeth in order to um, drive agencies to accountability. So data provides accountability, and that's what we need. Okay. Adam Hauser with CFACT. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for all your work on this important issue. Uh, just awesome talk today. I really enjoyed it. Uh, many of you, I think everybody have mentioned the effect that DDT has had on species in the past and how it's impacted ESA. Etc. Um, CFACT works with a lot of African communities that have been devastated with from malaria over the years since the banning of the DDT. Do you have any comment on some of the studies, such by Jay Gordon Edwards, that have kind of, you know, come against the fact that DDT could be impacting birds or whatever, or Nixon's EPA chief really just kind of um, brushing under the rug his own analyst finding of its limited impacts on species? Well, after it was re so. DDT was restricted in 1972 by one of the first acts of the EPA. It continued to be manufactured up until 1983 uh, in Long Beach, California. And, uh, and even though it was restricted in the US, uh, it was being exported. And so, for example, with falcons, we had a problem, we realized, with eggshell thinning still occurring on the California coast, but not inland. So that was our first clue that there's something going on here. Basically, a lot of these inland birds in Grand Canyon, for example, area were feeding on um, resident birds rather than migrants coming up the flyway. So uh, you know, you look at the chemical structure, and it is a potential endocrine disrupt disruptor. It's not going to affect every species. Some species are going to be more vulnerable than others just simply because of their uh, uh, physiology. However, uh, the way it was applied, it was blanket aerial application, and that was a huge problem. Some African countries have argued for a limited application of DDT just spraying underneath the eaves of uh, some of the buildings as a major effective way. And you know, certainly, I can see that as an alternative. I mean, and, and the fact is that to control malaria, to control mosquitoes, you need to have multiple tools in the box. If you just use one, resistance is going to develop. So you know, limited application, I don't see as being, you know, it can't be equated to the blanket aerial spraying. And in Africa, realized that they were doing blanket aerial spraying of DDT for tsetse flies. Like in Zimbabwe, they were doing, you know, 20 kilograms per hectare, you know, in three applications over 10 years. You know, it's like, it would, mass spraying was going on. Um, so, you know, but also they have to develop alternatives. And, you know, having worked in that field a little bit, you know, I can say that uh, integrated pest management, which includes some pesticide use and Careful application of how it's done and timing and spatially is really key. So, you know, it's another tool in the box. It's just the one you don't want to spread, you know, blanket spraying as it used to be. And this kelthane uh, that was 2 DDE molecules uh, covalently linked in 10% uh, contaminant, uh, that was sprayed over citrus crops in Southern California. And, you know, literally it was a change in the formulation overnight that uh, took that contaminant out. So, you know, they, they could move forward and re-register. So. Okay, I'm going to wrap up today. I, I want to uh, bring to everyone's attention the American conservation ethic. We have a little brochure, Land of Liberty, which outlines eight principles. And let me just remind you of the first principle and the last principle, but to tell you they're all important. Number one, people are the most important, unique, and precious resource goes to your point. We want to have good uh, stewardship of our natural resources. But the reason we do is because we want people to be benefited. And people are benefited when they have a good variety of uh, resources available to us to use and enjoy. The last principle, the eighth principle, is the most successful environmental policies flow from liberty. And the key element of liberty, limited government, Transparency. In, the, in lands of liberty, you have to know, you have to be able to get to the facts so that you can make good decisions to protect people's liberty and to make sure that people have the opportunity to live their lives according to their beliefs. So if you don't have one of these and you'd like one, be sure to get one before you leave. 
Let's give our panel a round of applause. It sounds to me like from the questions and the discussion and the time we've taken that perhaps we should plan one program a month here uh, to be able to dive into some of these important issues. Thank you all for attending. Thank you for watching online. And thank you, uh, gentlemen.